Hello everyone, Staphylococcus aureus is one of the most common causes of sepsis and despite modern medicine, the mortality rates for patients with staphylococcal bacteremia still exceed 25% and if everything is not done perfectly in the treatment of staphylococcal infections, this percentage can go even higher. This is because Staphylococcus aureus is simply the bug from hell. It's part of the normal human flora so you can't get rid of it. It has adhesive molecules with high affinity for all sorts of human tissues, but also for prosthetic materials like prosthetic joints, artificial heart valves, pacemakers. Once it enters the bloodstream, it metastasizes quite rapidly and lashes to the endocardium, bones, joints, parenchymal organs like the spleen, the liver, even the central nervous system. It has destructive enzymes that liquefy macromolecules and enable it to invade any tissue. Once it's in there, it forms biofilms and abscesses that protect it from antibiotics. It's extremely difficult to treat, not many antibiotics are effective against it. We all know about MRSA, but even our garden variety Staphylococcus poses a challenge. Instead of treating Staphylococcal bacteremia for let's say 10 to 14 days, 14 days is the bare minimum and often you have to extend treatment to 6 or maybe even 8 weeks, depending on the complications. Otherwise it relapses like a malignant tumor. Due to its propensity to form abscesses and biofilms, surgery is often required. And if it infects artificial material like an artificial hip or a mechanical heart valve, you can imagine the risk of such surgery. So obviously there is no room for error. And in this video I will show you what we can do better in practice and how we can avoid the most common mistakes. Tip number one. If you can, de-escalate from vancomycin. In the United States and many countries around the world, vancomycin is empiric therapy for suspected staphylococcal infections. And that makes sense because in the beginning, when you start treatment, you don't have antimicrobial susceptibility test results. So you don't know whether your staphylococcus is MRSA or wild type Staphylococcus aureus that is susceptible to anti-Staphylococcal penicillins. So you need to use an antibiotic that will reliably kill Staphylococcus even if it's MRSA and that's okay. But once you do have susceptibility test results and you see that Staphylococcus is susceptible to penicillins, you should make the switch. I emphasize this because many clinicians are reluctant to do so. They either think oh, vancomycin is a broader spectrum antibiotic and that probably makes it better, right? Or the patient is already getting better on vancomycin, so they think if it works, don't fix it. This is wrong because many studies have shown that anti-staphylococcal penicillins are more effective against Staphylococcus aureus than vancomycin, if it is susceptible, of course, if it's not MRSA. They lead to a better outcome, better survival. Not to mention that they are safer, less toxic drugs. We all know that vancomycin is nephrotoxic. And if your patient needs to be treated for four to six weeks, as is often the case, drug toxicity is an important consideration. So if you can, do make that switch to antistaphylococcal penicillins. And one extra tip. We all read American literature, American guidelines, and that's okay. But in infectious disease, nothing is better than your local guidelines. In the US, community-acquired MRSA poses a huge problem. That is why they always have to use vancomycin or some other drug that will reliably cover MRSA in empiric therapy. But in many European countries, this is not the case because community-acquired Staphylococcus aureus is usually susceptible to anti-staphylococcal penicillins. So you can go right ahead and use anti-staphylococcal penicillins right from the beginning as empiric therapy. So again, if you have them, take a look at your local guidelines. If you are to de-escalate from vancomycin, you will have to have antimicrobial susceptibility test results, which means you will have to isolate this staphylococcus aureus from somewhere. So if you have a patient with a suspected staphylococcal infection and a fever, make sure that you take at least, at least two sets of blood cultures in adults. This will improve the sensitivity of blood cultures and if you isolate staphylococcus from any one of them, this is significant. This is staphylococcal sepsis and please don't ignore it. If you don't find anything in blood cultures and instead you have a patient with a more localized infection like osteomyelitis or spondylodicitis, do your best to obtain a sample. So find an experienced cooperative surgeon who will suggest the best method to do that.
This is paramount because if you don't isolate the bacterium in question, if you don't have antimicrobial susceptibility test results, you will have no choice but to pound your patient's kidneys with vancomycin and other nephrotoxic drugs for weeks. And of course, that will ultimately affect the outcome. Okay, the next tip. You may run into certain articles where the authors claim that dedicated antistaphylococcal penicillins or cephalosporins are not superior to other beta-lactams like ceftriaxin, for example, which is a third-generation cephalo cephalosporin. This is all well and good for mild staphylococcal infections, but for serious infections like bacteremia or endocarditis, make sure that you use proper antistaphylococcal drugs. They are superior. A recent well-designed study that I included in the description shows just that, something that we've known all along. Next, for staphylococcal sepsis, for bacteremia, the minimum duration of treatment is two weeks. But here is the catch. Two weeks from the first sterile blood culture. Which means when you have a patient with staphylococcal bacteremia, you repeat blood cultures every 24 to 48 hours. Once the first blood culture becomes sterile, then you start counting. It's two weeks from that day. If the duration of treatment is shorter, there is a huge risk of relapse. And this is for patients with no complications like endocarditis and distant abscesses. How do you know that there are no complications? Well, there is only one way to know. You actively look for them. As far as you are concerned, remember, every patient with staphylococcal bacteremia has endocarditis until proven otherwise. In practice, this means that for every patient with staphylococcal bacteremia, you will order an echocardiogram, at least transthoracic, but often transesophageal as well. You will look for signs of endocarditis because from the heart, staphylococcus can metastasize anywhere, to the central nervous system, to the spleen, the liver, the kidneys, the spine. It can create epidural abscesses, anything. So this is the most central question. Every single patient, an echocardiogram. In addition to that, make sure you order an abdominal ultrasound as well to look for abscesses in the spleen and the liver. And for the rest, focus on the symptoms. Is there a new back pain or a focal neurological deficit or a swollen red joint? Depending on your patient's symptoms, you will order imaging like CT or MRI to look for distant abscesses. This is crucial because, of course, the presence of abscesses or endocarditis will alter your treatment plan. Many times surgery will be required, not to mention a prolonged course of antibiotics. So your initial two weeks of treatment just turned into four or six weeks, sometimes even longer than that. And here is the final tip. Whenever you have a patient with staphylococcal bacteremia, do consult an infectious diseases specialist. Studies have shown that involving an infectious diseases specialist in the treatment of staphylococcal bacteremia actually improves survival. No joke, because we have very strong feelings about Staphylococcus aureus, as you can clearly see, which makes us a bit more meticulous and even a little bit paranoid, which I would say is a good thing when dealing with Staphylococcus aureus. Of course, our primary concern is always endocarditis. Endocarditis is 100% fatal if not recognized and treated in time. Now, how do you recognize the symptoms and signs of endocarditis? Well, you can learn all about that in my next video. Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.